to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. And Michael, we're taping this here on a Monday, but this is an evergreen sort of podcast here because I know you'll be yeah. out of town later this week. So we wanted to work around. We still wanted to give the people two pods per week, but circumstances are we had to tape this on a Monday. So this one will be just kind of a, an evergreen podcast where we evaluate the off seasons now that we're sitting here in the month of June. Yeah, which is a great month. And, you know, by this time this will be up, we'll find out where we are in the NBA series uh, and we'll go from there. But, yeah, I mean, one thing about the NFL offseason is is the, the moves that are made. We're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about who's had good offseasons. And mm-hmm. let me just say this to start off with. I, I'm not a big fan of grading offseasons because I think for the most part, your O2 draft impacts your next season. And so because of that, you just really don't know if you had a good or a bad offseason. For example, I would say to Al Davis, let's sign player Y. And I had player Y graded as a 6-0 or a 59. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to replace a player who was a 57. And Al Davis would say to me, I don't want oh, fuck, I, I don't want to get incrementally better. I want to get a lot better. And so he wanted to make the 57 get coached up to a 59. And I fought that a lot. And then as I got older, I learned to accept it because, you know, you've got to try to work and teach your players how to get better within the system. And we're not equating that when you grade off seasons. Who's yeah. getting better? Who's taking that quantum leap from a year ago to now? Now, we know everybody's buzz light years ahead of everybody. <laughs> we got that, right? We understand they're light years ahead. Yep. However, it comes out on the tape. It's got to be proven. And I think that that's one element of an offseason. The other element is like the Chargers, who I have as one of the worst offseasons. But I say that with a caveat. If Nick, if Joey Bosa's healthy, if Slater's healthy, if Mike Williams is healthy for the whole year, if Keenan Allen's healthy, if their offensive lines, Corey Lindsay's healthy, those players who really weren't healthy all year and throw Khalil Mack in there, that gives them a hell of an offseason. That gives them a hell of an offseason if they stay healthy for 17 games. So I think you have to be careful judging the offseasons just straightly on who they acquired and who they let go. Yeah. And we can even throw Justin Herbert into that if he's healthy because he had the rib injury last year that he was kind of fighting through. Yeah, he he played all those games, but like, clearly you could tell he was a little bit uh, compromised there with that rib injury. So yeah, that's we're going to couch it with that. However, we are going to do the exercise, and we're going to start with our dessert because we like the dessert. We want to get sweet first before we get to the veggies and piss everybody off. Uh, so let's talk about the best off seasons here, Michael. Uh, I know they're not ranked one through five, but you have a category of these five teams that you wanted to highlight that have done well throughout this off season. Well, I, I mean, look, how do you not think the Jets have had a great off season? They yeah. got the one of the they got a blue chip level quarterback who didn't play like one last year, but he has the talent to to regain that, uh, and. Now, whether he's fallen off the cliff, I don't believe that to be true. I was concerned that Russell Wilson was falling off the cliff, but I don't believe it, Aaron Rodgers. So the Jets, by adding him and then adding some of the the players that they've added to the team, with the exception of Randall Cobb. I mean, no disrespect to Randall, but, you know, Lassard certainly will help them and their draft will help them. And But I think, to me, the other thing is, is Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson, those two guys who were great last year, they can improve. Mm-hmm. And that'll even make them a better defense. And so, for me, you know, when you add when – you, when you have a team that's a good team, not a great team, a good team, and you put a blue-chip level or maybe a red-chip level quarterback on that team when they didn't have it, all of a sudden – the receivers are going to even get better. All of a sudden, they're going to get more production out of other players. Bryce Hall's healthy. Mm-hmm. So I like what they did. Yeah, and I think also even getting Elijah Vera Tucker, their offensive lineman who they drafted in the first round a year ago or so, and like he's now going to be healthy because you can see that run game kind of took a step back when he got hurt. Like There was one of those injuries where well, it was Becton? mentioned. But how about Becton? Yeah, Becton, Becton, yeah. How about if Becton stays healthy and he's ever and he's the player? Look, let me say this about Becton. You can, mm-hmm. Everybody can make fun of him. But when the big man wants to play, he's really good. And when the big man can run block, and when your left tackle can run block like Becton can run block, and you're in 11 personnel, and the slot corners over there is the run force, it's going to get ugly. 
It'll get ugly. Now, they're going to play him at right tackle, which is, to me, completely ridiculous. I'll tell you, the, the most important guy on the Jets to improve is their head coach. He's got to get better. And if he doesn't think he's got to get better for all the golf he's going to play this offseason, his ass better get better. He better be talking <laughs> to people on how I can improve what I do. Man, he's golfing. He's clanging and banging in the weight room. <laughs> he's doing all those things. Uh, you have one AFC team here on your best NFL offseason. The rest are NFC teams, which I think is interesting because we see the balance of power in the conferences. I think a lot of people will say the AFC is superior to the NFC. So let's get to some of those NFC teams that you highlighted. Two of them are the teams we saw in the NFC title game, the Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers. Well, it's easy to have good offseason when you have a good team, right? Mm -hmm. Because you add just specific pieces to your team. San Francisco, we add Hargrave. We get Sam Darnold to be the backup quarterback if Brock Purdy can't go. So, by the way, did you see Trey Lance going through the bags? Did you see that? (laughs) I saw the I saw the throwing motion. It's did a little you see more that compact. On Twitter? Yeah, it's uh... see. Here's what I think people miss on that. Here's what I think people miss greatly on this. So everybody's watching the result of the throw, which is really not the the reason that was such a disturbing video. The reason that's such a disturbing video is because his feet are never in concert with his arm. Mm -hmm. So Bill Walsh wanted boxers to play quarterback. He wanted somebody who could jab and move, jab and move, jab and move. So your feet and your arm had to be tied together. That was really critical for him in the quarterback evaluation. Is his arm tied to his lower body? Brock Purdy's arm is, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Lance, when you watch that video going through the bags and trying to tie his feet to his arm, I don't give a shit how much he's worked in the offseason. That wasn't good. That's the main concern because like a golfer, if his feet aren't aligned perfectly when he's taking the club back, he's going to shank it, which is what he did. No, so he that that's a concern. I mean, everybody's focused on the result. The feet, the foot quickness was horrible. Is that something that you think you can improve or is that just an innate feel type of thing? I think it's an innate feel. I think it's just like anything. I think that's what he just doesn't have. That's why Minnesota, you know, doesn't take him as their star as to offer him a Division One scholarship. They maybe didn't see that. You know, there's reasons why guys go somewhere. There's a reason why Mitchell Trubisky went to North Carolina. There's a reason why uh, it, it, whatever we want to say about Will Levis that he had a transfer from Pitts. There's reasons you got to figure it out. That's what you do. But I, I like Philly and San Francisco. I mean, Philly's had a, a lot of pieces. Philly's draft last year I thought was good. Yep. Dean's got to come through for him. He's got to take a giant step. Jordan Davis has got to take a giant step for him. Carter's going to be a good player. They've added some nice pieces along the way. I mean, look, when you've got a good team and you've got an established team, these pieces become heightened that you add. And I think San Francisco and Philly did a nice job. What about Seattle, my old stomping grounds there? The Seahawks, you know, they were much maligned this time a year ago for everyone was wondering what they're going to do at quarterback. They were comfortable the whole time with Geno Smith. They ended up being proven correct. Uh, what did you make of their offseason here? Because you have them on as one of the best well, in the NFL. I, I think getting Jermont Jones really helps them. They needed a three technique badly. They haven't had one for a while. And they needed to get some more bulk in that front. And I think getting Bobby Wagner back, even though he's not the same level player he once was, he gives them some stability in their locker room. He gives Mm -hmm. them a sense of, you know, we can work through this. You know, we're going to get on this. You know, Jamal Adams will be a a linebacker in the box, add in the corner. I think to go along with Woodland, you know, that, that was another good move. And look, I'm counting on Charles Cross. I'm counting on Abraham Lucas, two rookie tackles who started 17 games to take their game to another level. And I'm talking on Kenneth Walker to stay healthy. I mean, this is a good team. And they've added some nice pieces to it. And, they, you know, they're driving the ball down the field uh, to tie San Francisco in that playoff game, and they, and they turn it over. You know, and Smith and, and Jigba, he gives them a slot receiver. I mean, they're good. And that offensive line with those two young tackles are only going to get better. Yeah, and you know they're going to be coached up there, and it's going to be competitive in training camp because that's the, the 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 lifeblood of that organization. There is competition, and Pete Carroll gets the best out of those guys. The last team that you wanted to highlight is a team that was picking first overall, but it wasn't by record. They traded up to get to that spot and draft Bryce Young. That's the Carolina Panthers. Well, I think you know, as I've been saying on the pod for a while, Carolina's not a bad team. I mean, they mm-hmm. they they're not a team that was devoid of talent. They weren't a typical, you know, they they they're a couple plays away from winning the South last year. I mean, just think about this. Matt Matt Rule's sitting in Lincoln, Nebraska today. He would still be in Carolina if Baker Mayfield had any kind of game in the first five games. I mean, let's be clear here. 
right? So they add a quarterback who's got great leadership skills, who's going to buy in. They've got a really good running game. They add Miles Sanders to that running game to go along with Chuba Hubbard. You know, I, I think that'll help them. I know Foreman was a big part of it, but Foreman's, you're always worried about Foreman staying healthy, and you're always worried about paying Foreman. Foreman's the best when he's hungry. And then you, add, then you look at defensively, you know, that they've got a good defensive team. Brian Burns has got to stay healthy. They got two really good corners. They weren't healthy all last year, so they get them to come back. I think they're going to be a hard out. I really do. I think they're, they're they kept some continuity with a really good line coach, you know, and, and certain. And so they were able to do that. And I think Frank Wright will get back to running the ball. Mm-hmm. James Campen, the the former player from the Packers, is a good line coach. I mean, he got that offensive line to play at a high level, you know. And, and the North Carolina kid. It, uh, has got to play better at left tackle. He can do that. You know, Tyler Moten's got to play. I mean, they're all going to get better within that same system. So I, I, I like Carolina. Yeah, no, I like Carolina as well. And I, I'm, I'm very close to just betting them to win the NFC South. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate in my head and say, all right, like, how does this not work out? Does New Orleans go ahead and beat them? Is it Atlanta that I'm missing on? Tampa, I've kind of crossed off my list there of teams that could win that division, but yeah. I, I really like Carolina a lot, and I'm kind of scared by how much I like them to win that division. I think they put together a really good coaching staff, and they have some really good, talented players as well. I, we had a little bit of crossover. I'll tell you, a sleeper them. player yeah. for Carolina, a mm-hmm. sleeper player for, is Chenault. Yeah. Th- this guy's dynamic. This guy's got Cordell Patterson like run skills when the ball's in his hand. He's a hard guy to tackle, you know, and, and if they get him the ball in a lot of these situations, you know, he's going to make a difference. No, he, he can be a, definitely a dynamic playmaker. We saw him against the Falcons on that Thursday night game, had the opening touchdown of that one, really dynamic. We had a um, – because I, I did this exercise as well because I wanted to kind of think through who I thought had the best yeah. NFL offseason. So we, well, there was two that we crossed over it on, and that was the New York Jets and the Carolina Panthers. I had them as well. But there's three teams that you didn't mention that I had here, the first one being the Miami Dolphins. I think that the coaching addition of Vic Fangio is going to be massive. And then also adding in Jalen Ramsey to that defense. Fangio knows how to use Ramsey, kind of that same style of defensive scheme that Brandon Staley kind of took from him as the understudy there. I think that that Dolphins defense is going to take another step forward with that secondary. And I'll tell you about the other two teams on the other side here because I want to get your thoughts on them because some people might not be thinking of these teams as good off seasons, but I think they took some significant steps forward to be much more competitive in 2023. Then we'll get to the worst off seasons as well. But let's take a quick break. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Let's continue this discussion of the best NFL off seasons. And there was a few teams that made it that almost made it on my list there. Seattle was one of them. I had them as a close, but not quite. Uh, I also had the Cleveland Browns in there as well. I like the additions that they've made up front. And then I'm not a homer, but I, I thought Dallas actually had a pretty solid off season as well. That's kind of gone a little bit under the radar and it sounds crazy, but I think Michael Parsons might take another mother. May I step forward as well. The way that he's been talking this off season about what he's been doing to kind of transform his body to handle the rigors of playing as a down lineman there. I think he could take even another step forward, which is pretty remarkable since he's one of the best defensive players in the league here. But Michael, these two yeah. teams, I wanted to bounce off of you here and get your thoughts. What did you make of the Denver Broncos? Cause the addition of Sean Payton going from Hackett to Payton, I think, is massive for Denver. And I also thought in free agency that first day, they really addressed both sides of the trenches there, especially that offensive line, kind of indicating that, hey, they want to get back to playing more physical power football. You know, I was in love with McGlinchey, as you know. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I think he's just an, an average. I thought they overpaid for him. But you can't underestimate the value that Sean Payton brings to their team. Vance Joseph, they get him back. We had Vic Lombardi on the show on the Lombardi line early uh, over the weekend, this past weekend, and he talked about how Vance Joseph has kind of – I asked him how he was dealing with coming back as a former head coach now as an assistant, and he said the, the players really feel in tune. We, we've said this all about Denver. They were a quarterback away from being a good team, you know, and they do have a good – now they have a good quarterback coach. Whether Russell can adapt, I don't know. He lost weight. He's going to be proud on that. But they won't mismanage games. They won't They – won't, make mistakes in games with Sean Payton. And here's the most important part about what Sean Payton's going to do. He's going to get his team ready to play for the season. I mean, last year, if you talk to Vic Lombardi, who covers the Broncos, or anybody who covered them, they were going through walkthroughs. They were on the Matt LaFleur program, just don't get anybody hurt, let's get to the season. Mm -hmm. 
And that takes a while. There was no pad level. There's no physical toughness. Denver will be a tougher team this year with Sean Payton. So I, I don't disagree. That That's part of an offseason, too. Like yeah. what you mentioned with Vic Fangio coming to Miami, I think that's a huge get. Now, it's going to be interesting if Vic Fangio and Mike McDaniel can kind of operate together because McDaniel sees himself as strictly the offensive coordinator. Now, how he manages the game, you know, they were 30, you know, they hired this guy to be the head coach because he's such a run game guru. They finished 31st in rushing attempts last year. It doesn't Explain make a that. lot of sense. <laughs> and they have a quarterback who's going to get hurt if he gets hit. Explain that. Yeah. And it's not like they were losing in a bunch of games. They were winning games. So, like, why aren't you running the football? <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense what they were doing in Miami. Maybe they can get that thing corrected. Because if they do run the football and lean on that run game and then use that play action game down the field there with Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle. That's a dangerous team that has a lot of explosive playmakers on both sides of the ball. I think they could be really good. The last team I wanted to highlight here for the best off seasons, call me crazy, but I kind of like what Houston did this off season. Like I, I thought Houston had a professional off season. I know they gave up a lot in the draft. Everybody's kind of still arguing about the whole Will Anderson, CJ Stroud thing. But I, I thought that the additions they made in free agency, getting in Shaq Mason and the via trade there, like that shows up an already pretty good offensive line. I thought having professional playmakers like Robert Woods, Dalton Schultz for a rookie quarterback that can help things out there. If C.J. Stroud is as good as they think he is, I think this Houston Texans team as a team can take a mother may I step forward and be a lot more competitive than the betting markets think they're with a win total of like five and a half or so. Yeah, I mean, they paid Shaq Mason more than the the Bucks paid wanted to pay him, and, and the Bucks wanted to cut him for the salary. I mean, Shaq Mason's been basically traded twice because nobody wanted to pay the salary, mm-hmm. and the Texans gave him a raise. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me, Femi. I mean, some of the moves, I mean, they've got more guaranteed money out there. They've signed players and cut them after they've given them guaranteed money. Like, I don't know what they're doing. I I see a collection of players. I don't see Mm. an offseason. I don't see a strategic, okay, here's our plan. Here's what we're doing. I see let's keep adding pieces. Let's keep adding. And there's no real, okay, here's the plan. Here's who we want to be. Here's what we're trying to do. You know, we need a quarterback. Okay, we need a point guard. Let's get a point guard. You know, so for me, I, 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 and then they waste money. I mean, look at all what they've wasted to get up to get CJ. I mean, they basically emptied the kid old caboodle of their of their Deshaun Watson deal. So have they improved their defensive line that much? I, I don't know. You know, Will Anderson. We'll see what he does. Jerry Hughes was a good player for him last year. Mm-hmm. You know, Denzel Perryman. I mean, he's good. You know, undersized linebacker that can run, but can he stay healthy? I mean, I, I, I have some real severe doubts. And, and then, okay. obviously, C.J. Stroud, how is he going? I know he's light years ahead. I got that. I'm fully aware of that. Well, he's he's, out there. he's evaluating quarterbacks as well. I don't know if you caught that one or not. But, but I just think that they were so devoid of talent a year ago that they needed to kind of add some of those pieces. Now, I'm not saying they're going to win the AFC South. I'm not going to go that far. I just think that they're going to be a much more competitive team because I, I'm buying into what they've done on both sides of the trenches there. Like, Will Anderson – like I'm not the hugest Will Anderson fan, but I think he can be a good player. Like he's not Bosa t- territory, which is where he was kind of picked. But I think he, he can be a be, pretty though. good. He picked yeah. him two overall. Yeah, he, you picked he, him he two overall. I mean, he's got to be Bosa territory. Yeah, but I mean, he just can't be good. No, I, I, for the price, of course, yes. But I think he'll be better than what they've had in the past. So well, I mean, Jerry Hughes was good for him last year. I mean, you know, Jerry Hughes played well. I I, I just don't see a plan. I don't see a vision. I really don't. And I love Nick. I think Nick's a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. I just don't see a vision. And then I see a lot of cap errors. I mean, tons of cap errors down there. Sign this player, cut him, give him a guarantee. They gave Shaq Mason a raise. I mean, Shaq Mason's one of the highest paid guards in the league. Why? Why? Like, he didn't play that well last year. You know? You trade up to get Juice Shrugs. I mean, how good is he going to be? I don't know. You know, I I, I don't see it. I mean, we we can debate that. I mean... They gave up a lot to get two players, Stroud and, you know, they gave up a lot to get Stroud or whether they gave up a lot to get Anderson, however you want to configure that. But for me, I, I don't see it. How's it all going to come together? Yeah, like, no, I don't no, know how. I mean, Robert Woods, they paid Robert Woods. I mean, he, Robert Woods couldn't do anything last year. I, I think second year off the ACL injury, he'll be a little bit better. I mean, it felt like he almost kind of rushed back with Tennessee there. Uh, after the Torres ACL a couple years ago. Maybe he'll be a little bit better. You know, the thing I love about you is your bag of excuses is unlimited. 
I mean, your bag Did he not of tear his ACL? is like, unlimited. I mean, you can reach as far down. I've never seen someone reach that far. I mean, you've got excuses to end all ex- I mean, that bag is freaking huge for excuses. It's unbelievable. I mean, the guy tore his ACL, man. You're the nicest guy. You are so nice. You are so nice. There, you don't have a mean bone in your body. Like you don't have uh, don't a mean. You're true. so nice. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying he's a he's a, a movement skill player, wide receiver, coming off a torn ACL. My guy Michael Gallup down in Dallas. He talked Who's about over it that way. You know, he's over thirty. He is, but he, he works. How hard. do they? Oh, <laughs> skill players over thirty. When do they make a comeback? I mean, I'll wait. <laughs> well. The, the games will be played in the fall. <laughs> Let's get to the worst off seasons. Uh, I know there were some teams that you wanted to highlight. You already teased it earlier. The Los Angeles Chargers ended up on your list. They didn't do a right. whole lot there, but you kind of couched it, though, that if they stay healthy, they can be one of the really good teams in the league. Right. I mean, the other team that didn't anything I have on my list is Green Bay. But Green Bay's got so many young players. I mean, Green Bay's really about player development. I, mm-hmm. I think the fascinating thing for Green Bay is going to be is what Matt LaFleur does – how he changes his mindset of, oh, we just got to stay healthy. He's going to have to really spend time drilling down on the team. He's going to have to spend time really creating fundamentals and techniques. I mean, I was listening to Phil Jackson on Rick Rubin's podcast. It was a three-hour interview. And Phil Jackson was talking about teaching fundamentals and drilling the players on the, the essentials of the game and not getting into the team element of it all. You know, even with the great Michael Jordan, you know, Ron Harper said to him sometimes, do we have to be so basic? You know, I mean, John Wooden used to teach, teach his team the first day on how to put their socks on. I think to me, LaFleur, it's going to be interesting if LaFleur can be adaptable and can he change? And is he willing to become a different coach? Because you can't be the same coach you were with Aaron Rodgers. I've been saying that for six, for a year and a half now. Yeah. But, I mean, they did nothing in the offseason, but they have players that they need to get better. That's going to be the key. Yeah, we're going to learn a lot about Matt LaFleur coming up here this entire season. And I'm, I'm excited to find out because you always have the question marks. Was he just carried by Aaron Rodgers? Was he also helping out? We're going to learn. I'm sure Big Daddy will be watching as well. Uh, a couple of teams who won the Super Bowl more recently, the Buccaneers did it in 2020. The Rams did it in 2021. Both of them end up on this list. Well, they're both on the list because they, they did it. They won Super Bowls mm-hmm. and they're in cap hell. You know, the Bucks have a talented team. They just have no flexibility. They can't do anything. They have, they're in trouble with the cap. They can't move. Then the same thing with the Rams. The Rams are going to be this really incredibly young team with a bunch of college free agents. And if Matt, Matthew Stafford gets hurt, then they're going to have to play Stetson Bennett, who, you know, I'm told that Les Snead, their general manager, fell in love with Stetson Bennett. I mean, he loves Stetson Bennett as a player, thought he was as good as anybody in the draft. So we'll mm-hmm. find out if that's true or not. I don't see it the way Les sees it, but Les is entitled, like I said, like I said about the draft, you, you, you know, everybody has an opinion. You can't criticize somebody's opinion as if you're right and they're wrong. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time seeing that in Stetson Bennett, but he saw it, so God bless him. But, I mean, they're going to play a bunch of young guys. Now, well, the other question is, will Sean McVay change who he is? Because Sean McVay's camps have always been more of a walkthrough, keep the team healthy, we got a really good team, which was true. And we just got to get to the season and we can't afford injuries in practices. He doesn't have that team anymore. He's got to practice. He's got to get these young players reps. Is Sean McVay long for this job here as the head coach for the, the Los Angeles Rams? I think I think he must be because he came back. I mean, there's no way they sat in Stan Kroenke's office and said, you know, I want to come back. And Kroenke didn't say, well, you know, this is going to be a little harder. Like, when they picked up the $57 million on Stafford, they went deeper into the hole again. They didn't come up. They're not getting closer to getting out of this. They mm-hmm. went deeper into it. Yeah. They had to pay $10 million to the Steelers to flop in the seventh to get rid of Allen Robinson. I, I mean, I got to give Stan, Stan Kroenke – you know, he's kept – He's and, and, and Michael Malone's a wonderful coach. But Kroenke it doesn't get enough credit for being patient. Some of the owners that I've worked for, if I would have paid Robert Woods, if I would have paid Brandon Cooks, if I would have paid Jared Goff, if I would have paid all these players, my and, and they're gone, I would have got my ass fired. Yeah. And Stan Kroenke, he's been one that's not afraid to pay the big bucks to try to build a winner, which I, I always tip my cap to the owners who are willing to pay to be winners because, hey – what else are you in this for? I mean, I get it. It's a money-making operation, and you're making money hand over fist. But, hey, you, you got to be competitive, and you got to want to win because that's but, ultimately what the fans want to see. But, but, but his vision, his, his patience mm-hmm. is really the greatest virtue. Yeah. 
No, I, I definitely agree with that because uh, they're going to definitely have to be patient <laughs> to get through this, uh, the, the, the dark times of the salary cap hell that they're in as well. Uh, before we head to break here, I wanted to tease this one up there because there's a team that's a big favorite in their division that ended up on this list. And I think a lot of people are expecting to take that mother may I step forward as a collective there, maybe even be a potential Super Bowl dark horse. We're going to talk about them on the other side. This is the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombard. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, Michael, let's get to the team that a lot of people are excited for because they made the playoffs a year ago. They even won a playoff game, and that's down in Duval County. The Jacksonville Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence, now in year three, which some people are saying is more like a year two after the rookie season and the dysfunction that they had his first year. But why did the Jaguars end up on your list of teams that had the worst offseason this year? Well, again, you know, when, when we use that term worse, it's really yeah. kind of unfair. I mean, I think to me the concern I have about Jacksonville's offseason is, look, let's be clear. They, they, they were behind in the Charger game, made a great comeback, and then they went into Kansas City and they really couldn't get that done. And so they're not quite to the level that we think they are. And I think part mm -hmm. of their problems in the offseason is how they're going to handle the expectations. I mean, this is a team that has finished, I think, 32nd in wins over the last five years, 32nd in wins over the last 10 years. I mean, that was a, that was a great resurgence, but sometimes there is a kind of a fallback. The schedule gets tougher. Teams don't take you – teams will take you more seriously. Remember, this is a team that lost to Houston earlier in the season. Yeah. So, you know, I just feel like the expectations of their season is going to be a challenge. I think Trevor Lawrence is great. Can he take a step forward? I think he has to. I think he's got to play more consistently than he did last year, and I thought he was getting better. I'm concerned about their left tackle. You know, is he going to be good enough? You know, they, they drafted the kid from Tennessee, Harrison. Can he play left tackle? Cam Robinson's going to miss some games. You know, Walker Little was a good player last year for them. So I, I love the – and I've said this all – I love the Calvin Ridley thing. But can they take that next step? I think that's the concern I have with their offseason. And they got to stay healthy. Yeah, they do have to stay healthy. I'm concerned with their pass rush there a little bit because their pass defense wasn't very strong last season there. And they're going to need that mother may I step forward from the number one overall pick from two years ago, Trayvon Walker. Can he be the guy that they drafted to be that disruptive force? He showed flashes last year, so I think it's in him somewhere. But they got to show it now on tape because they need him. They need Josh Allen to be able to protect those leads and be able to do it. Because I go back to the game, and you talked about it a lot, the, the Titans game in Week 18 – they almost lost to a team that had a quarterback for two weeks. Like, like Joshua Dobbs just right. showed up there, and they almost lost that game. Like You can't do that. And I think that sometimes because we saw the results of that game, that we see the results of the Charger comeback, it's like, oh, Jaguars are right there. They just got to take the next step. It's like they could have easily been out of the playoffs, and we'd be having a different conversation about this team. Well, I mean, look, you know, they, they beat Dallas in overtime, right? That yeah. was a fluky win for them. And then they play a bad Jet team. They play a bad Houston team. And then they play a bad Tennessee team. So they get to nine wins and make the playoffs with, with three bad wins, right? You know, mm -hmm. and, they, and they won the last five games against Tennessee, Dallas, the Jets, Houston, and Tennessee again. So, and I thought they were fortunate in some of their wins. I mean, let's face it. You know, they, they just... I think at the end of the day, when you break them down, I agree completely. They're going to have to get much better defensively. There's no question about that. Yeah, We'll see what they can do, but their win total is like around like 10, 10 and a half in some places. I think that's asking yeah, a little too much. Yeah, I under there. Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, I do I've, too. I've already bet it. I bet under 10 and a half because I don't think, that, I think this is like a nine win team, maybe 10 and seven, but under 10 and a half, 10 and seven means I would win my bet. So the, there's that. I still think they win the division, though. Um, so we had the Jaguars. We, I agreed with you on that one. Also, the Rams and Bucks I had on my list there. I also threw Minnesota on that list, and I get that their hands were tied this offseason. They kind of had to reset yeah. the deck, but they didn't fully reset the deck because now they're bringing Kirk Cousins back. I thought the Vikings took a step back this offseason, me personally. Well, they had to, right? I mean, yeah. they're, they're in that. I think that there's a classification we should use, but bad offseason related to cap. Yeah. There goes Tampa, there goes the Rams, and there goes Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when you say bad offseason, you're saying their GM doesn't know what he's doing. And he no. just, to me, they're, they're, their hands are tied. Yeah. And they're tied around, and Cousins has tied them. 
And so every decision they make is because they've gone all in. They just haven't gotten the rewards. And they're going to have to develop young talent. I think adding Brian Flores will really help them defensively. I think that's a good offseason move there. Mm -hmm. Just like the Vic Fangio one in Miami will help them. But I, I do – I think there's a category that you almost have to put teams in that there's a mess we got to clean up. And if we don't clean this mess up, then it th this is why. And by cleaning the mess up affects our offseason. What did you make of Tennessee's offseason? Because the, the losses on the offensive line, those concern me. Like Ben Jones was one of the leaders on that offensive line, the center. Taylor Lewan, he had his injury issues. And I guess they kind of gotten used to playing without him, to be honest. But like losing those kind yeah. of pillars of the organization, I think that's a little bit tough to overcome. Well, but I mean, here's what I would say to you on that. None of those guys played any good, so why do you care if you lost them? I mean, you know, it's Le one leadership. thing to lose a pro bowler and say, yeah. oh, we, yeah, I mean, well, but I mean, like, I, I, I know, but they got a good leader in Vrabel. Yeah. But to me, you know, look, this guy didn't play any good, so what do we what do we really lose? I mean, we lose name appeal to the media, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, when you're watching the tape, you know, I don't know. Now, that Andre Dillard's got to come in. I, I didn't love the offseason because I don't love Will Levis. I mean, Will Levis, you know, you know, he struggled to beat the guy out in high school. He didn't even beat the starting quarterback out in high school until his senior year. So, like, I'm not in love with Will Levis. So, you know, I think that's going to be a problem. And defensively, look, that, I, but I, I love Rabel. I think Rabel mm -hmm. makes this team better. So I don't doubt him at all. You no, know, Rabel definitely raises the floor for that team there, what he's able to do as a head coach. Always has him ready to play. David Long, I know a guy that we're both fans of, he deals with injuries as well, if he can stay healthy, but he's now in South Beach in Miami. When he plays, man, he plays with his hair on fire. <laughs> like, like that's, that's an yeah, that, awesome that, player. <laughs> that's under a radar signing by Miami that was outstanding. And, it, and he, if he stays healthy, he'll really make, he'll make their defense faster. Because as I say all the time, when your mic's fast, your defense is fast. Mm -hmm. When your mic's slow, your defense is slow. Yeah, and I think Miami, speed, speed, speed is what they've uh, – leaned into with that team down there trying to go ahead and beat the likes of the Buffalo Bills and now the New York Jets who had one of the better off seasons here this season so that does it for our off season report card the progress report obviously we'll see how these teams kind of fully form training camp about six weeks away which is kind of crazy to say out loud we're close to it the f cut of the fresh grass and everything like that we're going to start smelling it and we're going to start putting some players on the field and see who can play and who can't play and then before you know it the regular season will be here but that does it for this thursday edition of the podcast we will be back with you guys on monday thank you to our producer elliot bowman with us on the ones and twos thank you to DraftKings. thank you to Vison. thank you to you michael thanks for doing the exercise i know you don't like to grade all these teams here but we had to do the exercise because we thought it'd be a lot of fun but i'll talk to you on monday man Thank you, Femi, and I love your bag of excuses. It's brilliant. There's nobody has the bigger bag. I gotta. I couldn't even buy you a big enough bag. It's a year or two off the ACL. It'll be much better. <laughs>